Good evening and welcome to everybody. Welcome to our regulars. If you're new to our sessions and a first time, a welcome to you. <clears throat> My name is Alan Friedman. I'm Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association and I am again the MC for this evening. Also participating tonight is Michael Bird, my co-host for Nothing Left that we did on Jewish Community Radio for five years. Good morning, uh, good evening to you, Michael. Good evening, uh, Alan, David and David. Okay, also visible, visible on your screens are David Adler, President of the AJA, as well as our guest for tonight, David Weinberg, who we, who we will introduce formally in a moment. Um, tonight's topic is something on all our minds at the moment, and that is the, the changing relationship between Israel and the United States. Uh, for the format will be as usual. Uh, Michael and I will chat with David for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. So, uh, as always, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand electronically. Uh, the way to do that is to click the participants or the reactions button uh, along the bottom and that will send us a signal that you uh, you want to ask a question and we put you in the list and we keep everybody in order. The chat function uh, is functioning as usual and as usual I always ask people to just stick to, to, the, to tonight's topic. I think everybody in this audience watched with dismay as President Trump had to leave office apparently as, as the result of a free and fair election, but which I and many others have doubts about. <clears throat> but regardless of the process, America got Joe Biden as president, and this has naturally meant changes from the very pro-Israel stance that Donald Trump took. We have seen uh, Biden appoint a slew of anti-Zionists to positions in his administration. We have seen the anti-Semitic squad feeling emboldened and empowered to speak up in criticism of all things related to Israel. But we've also seen Joe Biden stand up for Israel during the recent conflict with Hamas in saying that Israel has the right to defend itself. So what's going on? Are things not as bad as we anticipated or are they in fact worse? Has the relationship between Israel and the American Jews changed over the years? And is Israel equally or less supported by the US than it has histori historically been. To help so sort through this conundrum for us, we're joined by David M. Weinberg in Israel, who is fa a founding vice president and fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for St Strategy and Security, a security think tank that we are all well familiar with. And David regards to Ephraim Inbar when you see him. And he's also the, the Israel office director of Canada's Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. He is the diplomatic defense and political com columnist for the Jerusalem Post and Israel Hayom newspapers. Since moving to Israel in 1990, David has served in a number of public positions, such as founding coordinator of the Global Forum Against Anti-Semitism in the Israeli Prime Minister's Office and senior advisor to then Deputy Prime Minister Natan Sharansky. For many years, he was spokesman of the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, of the Herzliya Conference on Israel's National Security, and of Bar Ilan University. David has spoken in Israel, Canada, and the US and Europe, and at many shuls, federations, advocacy forums, and universities. He has appeared as an expert witness on CBC, CNN, Israel TV and radio and has been quoted in the New York Times and other international publications. David holds a master's degree in international relations from Bar Ilan University and a bachelor's degree in international relations and history from the University of Toronto. That's a long CV and I have to say I didn't read all of it. But David, welcome to the AJA via Zoom and thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you, uh, David, uh, David and Alan. It's uh, great to be with you. Um, raise your hand, Alan, if you can hear and see me. Yep, yep, you're, you're going, you're going well, David. Thank you. Okay, okay. very good. I'm, I'm going to brief for approximately uh, ten minutes, and then be happy to uh, get into uh, discussion with you. And I'm going to uh, focus in my initial remarks on uh, the Abraham Accords, because I believe that attitudes towards the Abraham Accords um, are a prism through which 
one can judge uh, and evaluate broader perspectives on Israel, on US-Israel relations and Middle East policies. Now, I'm sure you all know that um, the Abraham Accords have taken off at uh, a lightning speed in ways unimaginable um, just one year ago with intensive bilateral cooperation agreements already in place between Israel and Bahrain and to Israel and the Emirates um, in tech, in banking, uh, in tourism, and to a certain extent also with Morocco and Sudan. It's a lightning piece bonanza, a whirlwind of almost uh, biblical proportions. The problem is, is that some around the world remain very begrudging um, in their embrace of of these accords. For the extreme left, it's very hard um, to accept, to swallow the fact that Israel is demonstrably a force for good, prosperity, um, and stability in the Middle East. After all, that is the reason that the Emirates and the Bahrainis are partnering with Israel. Second of all, uh, the left has been uh, reluctant to credit Donald Trump or Benjamin Netanyahu uh, for the accords or for anything else. Uh, even when the result is so beneficial. Third of all, the left, and this includes the Biden administration, uh, wants to reinstate the JCPOA uh, nuclear deal with Iran, Iran that Israel and its Gulf partners remain adamantly opposed to. Uh, in fact, the common front against the nuclear and hegemonic designs of Iran were the glue um, that brought about these accords and they underline, uh, they underlie Israel-Gulf relations. But the Abraham Accords uh, get in the way of the U.S. rush to reconciliation uh, with Iran. Expansion of what uh, used to be called the Abrahamic Circle of Peace uh, would be an insult um, to the Iranians. Expanding it to say Saudi Arabia, Oman, uh, Indonesia or Kuwait, would anger the Iranians. And as a result, it does not seem that the Biden administration is prioritizing enlargement of the Accords. In fact, the administration will not even use the term uh, Abraham Accords. Fourth of all, um, some, particularly on the left, are uncomfortable with the renewed religious discourse about biblical patrimony and rights um, that underlies the Abraham Accords. I'll remind you that they were specifically called the Abraham Accords uh, as a way of referencing the common Abrahamic um, heritage of Muslims and Jews. Um, and they implicitly acknowledge that Jews are a biblical people uh, indigenous to the land of Israel. Now, this is a revolution. It's a blunt rejection of the ongoing Palestinian campaign to deny and criminalize the Jewish people's historic rights in Israel. But nevertheless, as I say, um, some on the left are uncomfortable with this, um, with this discourse. It's, to their ears, it smacks of uh, evangelical Christian or right-wing Orthodox Jewish standpoints. And the only rights they're really comfortable with, of course, are the liberal, politically correct, intersectional kind in which Palestinian rights are paramount. And fifth and finally, um, it certainly upsets the progressive uh, publics and the left wing of the Democratic Party in the US that the Abraham Accords sideline the Palestinians. Uh, after all, one can no longer argue that the Palestinian struggle is the crux of uh, Middle East conflict. Um, Sunni states now partnering with Israel um, even question whether there is an urgent need or sufficient justification for the Palestinians to gain a state of their own. So for all these five reasons that I've just enumerated, um, left of center leaders have assiduously been poking holes uh, in the Abraham Accords uh, and making sourpuss faces every time um, somebody highlights the roadrunner fast uh, advances in Gulf Israel ties. Um, some uh, American officials in the new administration have even signaled their disdain uh, for the Abraham Accords, 
they've had a number of ways of doing this. One way, of course, is to give a cold shoulder, cold uh, shoulder to U.S. and Israeli allies in the region like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, beginning to highlight their human rights abuses. Um, they've even spoken, some American officials have even dangerously spoken, spoken about uh, reassessing ties with Saudi Arabia. As we know, the administration pulled its support um, for the Saudi war on the Iranian-backed Houthis uh, in Yemen, which is a terrible strategic mistake. And for a while, uh, it held up the F-35 sale uh, to the Emirates. Now, this pattern of attitudes towards the Abraham Accords um, continues on in, um, toward, into the uh, attitudes <clears throat> towards uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, here, the Biden administration should again be working to build on Abraham Accord dynamics uh, instead of letting the Palestinian Authority get away with violence, and that includes issuing a fatwa, a religious decree against any Emirati Muslim visitor praying on the Temple Mount, um, and instead of working assiduously to rebuild uh, Gaza, um, something that will assuredly strengthen Hamas, uh, the Biden administration should be pressing the Palestinian Authority to um, accept Emirati and Bahraini mediation. It should, instead of restating aid and talking about opening the consulates once again in Eastern Jerusalem, it should be pressing the PA to stop calling for jihad and spreading the Al-Aqsa lie. That, of course, is the lie that Israel is threatening to blow up or undermine the mosques on the Temple Mount. And that brings me to um, directly, well, before I get to Iran, let me make one other point. It's important to note uh, that in the recent dust up between Israel and Hamas in Gaza and Israel and Palestinian radicals in Jerusalem, um, no Gulf country uh, did more than mildly protest Israel's tough police actions in Jerusalem. No Gulf country withdrew its ambassador uh, from Israel. Uh, no Gulf country did more than protest. And if you recall, compare this to the Second Intifada in 2000, when four Arab states, Tunisia, Morocco, Oman, and Qatar, dissolved um, the semi-diplomatic ties they had with Israel up in that, until that point. And of course, none of the Gulf countries, none of the Abraham Accord countries, really criticized Israel's war against Hamas and Gaza at all. In fact, they probably cheered this uh, quietly. Um, the mild press releases they put out um, resembled State Department uh, calls for de-escalation and restraint. Um, in short, none of these Arab countries added to the diplomatic pressure on Israel in any substantive way. Which brings me finally to Iran, the real shadow the real shadow hanging over the future of the Abraham Accords and their expansion uh, comes from the incipient reconciliation between Washington and Tehran in the form of a renewed nuclear deal. You might argue, you might think, on the one hand, that if Washington goes soft on Iran's nuclear program and dials back its commitment to countering uh, Iran's regional hegemonic ambitions, uh, then it would be logical for Gulf countries to uh, further strengthen their security and diplomatic ties with Israel. After all, Israel is going to remain actively engaged in a long-term shadow war with Iran, a, a war that's increasingly becoming uh, public. And Israel can quietly but determinedly um, help protect its Gulf allies from Iranian machinations as well. On the other hand, um, if the US takes itself out of the front line against Iran, it is possible that Gulf countries will reluctantly uh, make the decision uh, to bandwagon with Iran, or at the very least to um, hedge their bets by minimizing uh, their open ties to Israel and their full alignment with the US. Uh, this process may already be underway. Uh, 
Uh, for the first time in many years, the Emiratis and the Saudis have held direct and public talks uh, with Iranian leaders. This could be a signal that Gulf leaders realize Washington will no longer lead a counter Iran coalition and that allying openly with Israel may no longer be overwhelmingly uh, beneficial for them. And then we get into um, our local politics. There is also the question of Israeli leadership. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu personally played um, a key role in cultivating uh, relations between Israel and the Emiratis and Bahrainis, as well as unofficial ties with Saudi Arabia. Uh, the leaders of these countries know Netanyahu well enough to talk to him about key defense and intelligence issues. And they knew that his commitment to uh, aggressively countering, countering Iran was absolute. Um, one has to ask, will the same level of trust uh, pertain if Israel is led by a coalition of Naftali Bennett, Benny Gantz, and Yair Lapid? And one has to remember that the accords were based on the perception of Israel as a strong country, strong diplomatically, and that includes standing up to Obama on Iran, um, strong and close with the Trump administration, uh, strong militarily. Israel's the only country that's actually fighting Iran uh, in Syria, Iraq, uh, and Iran itself strong uh, in terms of intelligence, strong in terms of its economy and its military tech and so forth and so on. And the, the Gulf states were bandwagoning around a winner, uh, meaning Israel. Our new leaders, our apparent new leaders as of next week, um, well, um, Yair Lapid has made statements uh, supporting the JCPOA. And Benny Gantz has demurred from some of Netanyahu's uh, strong comments about countering Iran, even if the United States uh, backs away from doing so. And it's unclear whether Naftali Bennett will make um, expansion of the Abraham Accords a priority, of course he should, and whether he can quickly gain the uh, trust of, of Gulf leaders. So the essential interests between Israel and Gulf countries, between Abraham Accord countries, um, uh, remain intact, and um, one can expect that the economic ties be, uh, between the countries will continue to grow. But the level of cultivation of those ties, um, and um, whether there'll be more opportunities to bring additional countries into the Abraham Accords, given the new government in Washington, well, that remains uh, to be seen. I'll uh, stop there and be glad to okay. further engage you on uh, any of these issues. Okay, David, that's uh, thank you for that. So just to go back one step, um, I wonder if you've noticed if anything's changed since the departure of President Trump. Um, uh, well, we, we, we can see things have changed, but, but are we simply seeing a rerun of the Obama years? Or is there something uh, inherently different about Joe Biden's administration? Okay, the um, I would say the jury is still out on that. It's too it's too soon to tell. However, I think there are three um, things that we can say about the Biden administration thus far. Uh, number one, um, Biden does not carry the does not seem to carry the same personal animus. Um, towards Israel that uh, uh, Barack Obama um, clearly had. Um, he doesn't have a chip on his shoulder about Netanyahu personally, the way Barack Obama uh, clearly had. Um, he does not buy into the uh, hard left um, you know, racialist discourse about Israel being a uh, white colonialist occupier state uh, beating up on poor brown and black um, indigenous oppressed people. Um, you know, he's not a supporter of the BDS movement or, or anything like that. And um, as you mentioned in your introduction, Alan, uh, the Biden administration gave Israel decent, although not um, absolute support um, during its 
11 day long uh, fight with, um, with Hamas. Now, some will say cynically that of course Biden did so. I mean, it's, it's obvious that Hamas is, is a super bad guy supported by Iran. Um, and in doing so, he bought credit with Israel. How could Prime Minister Netanyahu or incoming Prime Minister Bennett, if he is going to be in fact Prime Minister, how can they oppose and come out strongly against Biden when he unveils a nuclear deal, a renewed nuclear deal with Iran when he just you know, backed Israel so intensively both at the UN and in other forums uh, regarding the conflict with Hamas. So if you wanna be cynical, you'll say that the two things are connected and there's a nefarious uh, connection between the two. I, I take it at face value that Biden um, believes that he has um, Israel's uh, best interests at heart, but there are obviously uh, other members of the administration who have a different agenda. And this administration is absolutely committed to returning to the uh, JCPOA. The Iranians are not making it easy for them. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, Secretary of State Blinken's remarks to Congress on uh, Monday, two days ago, uh, he appeared both before uh, Senate and uh, House of Representative committees and uh, Blinken was somewhat circumspect about whether uh, the Iranians truly want a return to the JCPOA. After all, they've made um, so many advances way beyond the parameters of the JCPOA that they would have to give up now in order to return to the court that it may not be worth it for them. And if they've got all sorts of other ways through the Iranians, through the Chinese and through the Russians and through the Germans and through the French to skirt the sanctions regime that uh, was in place during Trump's time, then uh, they may not need mm. this renewed accord uh, with Washington. Uh, so, you know, th th that's, that's how I evaluate things with the Biden administration, but um, there will be many more crises. Um, and Israel will undoubtedly go to war again against Hamas or Hezbollah uh, in the coming years. Um, and it may increase its uh, targeted strikes on uh, Iranian fortifications in Syria, as well as its targeted assassinations of uh, senior Iranian figures. And um, it'll be very clear whether the administration uh, backs Israel up on these things, as Trump did, or it dials away and criticizes Israel. Hmm. Michael. Yeah, um, David, um, Israel's next government is yet to be finalized, and you write that a straight jacket change coalition would be good for Israeli politics and society. Can you please elaborate on this both domestically and in terms of the US relationship? Sure. Um, thank you, Michael. Uh, indeed, I did write in this past uh, Friday's newspaper as a uh, op-ed column that uh, suggested the most important thing that this uh, new government could do would be to tone down uh, the rhetoric. Uh, we've gone through almost three years of uh, repeated election campaigns that have been vehement, vicious, uh, nasty, um, and the level of conversation has only gotten worse over the last 10 days with um, the two uh, camps uh, swearing out at each other in the most vicious terms. And I really believe that Israel needs to calm down, that Israel needs to take a step back and um, lower the uh, level of vehemence in our internal politics. To a great extent, Netanyahu is responsible for that. You know, as much as you or I may think him to be the um, greatest strategic leader Israel has had in decades and someone who, without whom, uh, Israel would never have um, survived through the difficult years of the so-called Arab Spring, uh, without whom someone, Israel would never have been able to keep Iran at bay for all these years, without whom uh, the Trump administration would not have enacted all the important reforms in US policy that it did, and without whom Israel would not have um, 
had a strong economy over the last 20 years and without whom Israel would not have come out of the corona crisis so well. And yet, despite all that, um, he has become uh, extraordinarily acerbic and, um, and divisive. Um, anybody who's not with him is a traitor. Uh, that's the, and by the way, the left is the same thing. Anybody who supports a continued uh, Netanyahu administration is a traitor to Israel's, you know, uh, supposed liberal values. Um, the discourse has become very ugly. Um, I think it would be good um, for Israel to be stuck with a, um, a right, left, semi-unity government for a little while where everybody um, has to keep their passions um, and their wildest political ambitions in check. In other words, most Israelis have little expectation that this new government, if it actually um, is sworn in on Sunday, will be able to move much or do much or change much other than um, uh, pass a budget, um, begin to rehabilitate the economy, uh, bring down levels of unemployment and manage uh, without any grand uh, moves, um, Israel's relations with the Palestinians, the Americans and everybody else in the world. This is not a government um, that's going to, um, on the one hand, bring about um, withdrawals from Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, nor is it going to annex any part of Judea and Samaria. This is not a government um, that is going to bring about a recognition of reform and conservative conversions and uh, marriages in Israel, uh, nor is this a government that's going to um, um, overturn uh, you know, the ultra-Orthodox control of, of the chief rabbinate. Um, this is not a government um, that's likely to um, go to war, uh, open war um, against Iran, um, or buck the United States on, on major issues. Uh, but it is a government that will try to manage these things for as long as it lasts and until uh, there's some sort of frishmish, some sort of remixing of the political constellations and uh, we'll have renewed elections. I think that um, you want to call it a government of, um, of paralysis. Uh, you want to call it a government of uh, some calm would be good for Israel's um, Israel's uh, fabric for for the next while. Yeah, yeah, um, yes. So it, it sounds, David, what what you're saying is that it's really just going to be able to allow Israel to be in some sort of holding pattern, just so that everybody can take a breather. Um, is the is the the critical uh, element in all of this Bibi Netanyahu? Um, so so once he's well and truly out of the picture, if that's what happens. Does that mean, are we really waiting for that to happen so that politics can resume as normal, you know, the normal uh, haggles between left, right, and so on? Uh, yes um, and no. First of all, one can't rule uh, Netanyahu out. I can think of um, five different types of circumstances which could yet force Netanyahu out of active Israeli politics that were not there yet. One could be a Supreme Court decision that he's ineligible to run again once he's out. Second could be legislation passed in Knesset, which is being talked about, which would bar anybody who's already served, you know, two or three terms, eight years, six years, 10 years as prime minister from running again. Uh, third could be uh, a challenge uh, internally within Likud. There are at least three prominent Likud leaders who will challenge Netanyahu um, for Likud leadership. That includes Yuli Edelstein, um, Nir Barkat, and uh, Israel Katz. They've, no one's ever been able to do that before. The only guy who tried that and lost, of course, was Gidon Saar. And then he left Likud and founded his own party. And he's coming back into government with this no coalition uh, if it happens. Um, and I can think of a number of other scenarios where Netanyahu perhaps cuts a deal with the attorney general to uh, end his trials and um, uh, pay a fine and then is pardoned by Israel's new president, Chaim Herzog, so that he never goes to jail. I would be, I think most Israelis would be uh, very supportive of a uh, 
presidential pardon entering this saga of legal suits against Netanyahu, uh, most of which seem uh, frivolous or um, um, you know, mean-spirited uh, to begin with. So it, it's not clear um, where Netanyahu goes from here. Uh, he says that he's going to fight on, uh, and that he's going to be a, um, an active leader of the opposition and try to bring down this new coalition government as soon as possible. Um, we'll see. Okay. Um, David, you've noted that the Biden administration is leaking instances of Israeli attacks on Iranian assets, such as ships and so forth. Well, we, we think they're Israeli attacks. Um, either that or Iran is very unlucky lately. Um, how does Israel view this if, if the Biden administration is leaking some of this stuff? And is it likely to, to significantly hinder Israel's quiet attempts to undermine Iran's activities? Um, good question. Um, indeed, about two months ago, it was clearly the administration that leaked to the New York Times um, the uh, fingering of Israel uh, in the um, sabotage of uh, several Iranian ships, both in the Persian Gulf and um, in the Red Sea. Uh, it was a way of outing uh, Israel's um, uh, aggressive forward actions to stymie the Iranians. Um, and this takes us back, way back to the bad old days of Obama. If you recall in 2012, unnamed US diplomats and intelligence officials exposed um, IDF and Mossad activities in Azerbaijan, um, which is a Muslim country that borders Iran. And uh, that was clearly meant to scuttle the uh, possibility of an Israeli airstrike on Iran's nuclear facilities from Soviet air bases uh, near Baku, which is only 500 kilometers um, from Tehran. And of course, in the wake of those leaks, Azerbaijan was forced to deny any Israeli presence and scaled back whatever intelligence or military basing Israel had then. It was an ugly and underhanded move by the Obama administration. Um, and uh, it does seem that the administration, the new administration is using the same playbook to sideline Israel in the context of the current talks over uh, re-engaging uh, the JCPOA. Um, now, since then, there has been supposedly a uh, reconnecting of Netanyahu and Biden as administration officials. You'll recall that uh, the chief of the Mossad, and the IDF chiefs of staff, um, and uh, the chief of the Air Force, and the national security advisor, and just last week, the defense minister Gans all made um, highly publicized trips to Washington for um, intensive talks. And the US, new US defense secretary was just here two weeks ago, the first Biden uh, cabinet member to visit Israel. And both sides are, both countries are now um, making a point of indicating that they're more closely coordinated and they're not going to snipe at each other like this or undermine each other behind the scenes. But I'll still say that um, Israel is going to remain active in uh, interdicting uh, Iranian efforts to surround us and to base uh, revol revolutionary guard bases just over our northern border. Um, Without you know clear backing from Washington on this, uh, things will get sticky. Okay, thank you, Michael. We'll uh, take your question and then we'll go to the audience. I think. Uh, yeah, uh, David, uh, you write that Israel is fighting Islamic jihadism, just like the West. Uh, do you think there needs to be some new approach to Hasbara? <laughs> Hi, thank you again, Michael, for that. Um, that second question, um, yeah, there's no question that uh, what we have been doing, what advocates of Israel have been doing uh, for so many years, you know, is is falling is falling short. Um, and you see people uh, succumbing to uh, Hamas's genocidal agenda, um, and it's frustrating that democratic leaders uh, profess support for Palestinian rights and yet ignore Hamas's 
murderous attentions against Israel. Um, and they overlook its total backing by Iran. Um, and they seem to discount um, the Hamas instigated uh, attacks on Israeli Jews in Jerusalem, where they blame Israel for, you know, for causing the conflagra uh, conflagration. And therefore, there's got to be um, new ways of, 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 approaching, um, of approaching this. Um, I've argued that um, one of the things that we have to stop doing is playing the victimhood card. We can't compete. Uh, with the Palestinians uh, for being the victims. It doesn't wash. People see the pictures of Israeli uh, just missile destruction in Gaza, and they're convinced that we are the overdog, not the underdog. And we are. Um, we are much stronger. Um, and um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that to, you know, to argue that we're the underdog were the victims, no matter how many times we'll recount Arab atrocities, it's a hard sell uh, because, as I said, they don't view us a, as the underdog. And therefore, we have to own up. We have to own up to Israel's strength. And we have to articulate how it is right and wise for Israel to be fighting, um, as you said, Michael, um, is Islamic jihadism, which is a challenge that the West face as well. It's, we're fighting the people that celebrated bin Laden's attacks in Washington, Paris, and elsewhere. And in this regard, we have to stop apologizing for using disproportionate force. Yes, Israel uses disproportionate force. Uh, we use overwhelming force to deter our enemies. Um, and we shouldn't be shy about saying that. Um, we don't need to pull punches just to prove that we're the nice guy. People won't believe that Anyways, and there are other things that Israel could be doing and should be doing different. Um, uh, and um, part of that is restating the basic justice of our cause. Um, Israel as a grand um, historic reunion of, of land and people, um, uh, as the place of the Jewish people's contribution in the 21st century to music, art, literature, science, and medicine. Um, as a reliable anchor of democracy in this you know, dangerous part of the world. Nobody talks like this anymore. It's all about how we have to protect Israel's security and we have a right you know, to, uh, Israel has a right to defend its citizens. And, and to a certain extent, we've dialed away from restating um, the righteousness of the Zionist cause, whereas the Palestinians are always talking about their rights and their historic rights and so on. Um, so yeah, we do need to do things differently. And I think that if we do so, even liberals can grudgingly come to the point, uh, come to see that Israel has a point. Um, we might be tough and gruff, uh, but we also have a reasonable case. Okay, thanks, David. Now we'll go to your, your questions. Uh, Andy, you're first, and then we've got Ron, Jeff, Steve, Gary, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, there's many there. I can see you many. Um, okay, Andy, please uh, ask your question. Thank you. In today's Times of Israel, there's an article that says B BDS protesters blocked an Israeli ship from the Oakland port. The American government didn't do anything. And these BDS backers plan actions to keep ships away from more U.S. ports. And what it reminds me is what happened with the people who left Europe from the Holocaust trying to come to America. What is the American government doing? Hmm. Um, okay, I, I understand the question. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer for you directly, but I will, I'll give you an indirect uh, answer, which raises questions about all the focus on BDS. Yes, there are BDS activists, um, and they're on campus, and they make a lot of noise. Um, and the more noise and more attention they get, uh, the more wind we're putting on their into their sails. I, I wonder whether um, it isn't smarter in some cases to deny these groups the oxygen that they're looking for, which of course is publicity, since in the end, uh, BDS activism and BDS damage to Israel's global economic fortunes has been 
um, very limited. And we're, we've been talking about, you know, the threat of BDS for over a decade now. And entire organizations have been set up to fight BDS. And yet the BDS movement has never amounted to much. There's always going to be that coming from the hard left. I, I sometimes suspect that it's the Israeli political left and their left-wing supporters abroad who are constantly harping about the threat of a BDS as a way of arguing that, oh my God, look what Netanyahu is doing. He's isolating Israel. We have to give in to the Palestinians. We have to come to an urgent compromise with the Palestinians. Otherwise the BDS tsunami will continue to grow and overwhelm Israel and will become isolated. It's almost like the boy crying wolf. There's sometimes too much attention, I feel, given to um, local BDS activities. It's not the grand threat um, to Israel's fortunes that have, sometimes it's made out to be. And as I said, I suspect that sometimes it's the left that is playing up the BDS movement as a way of trying to scare Israelis mm -hmm. or scare American Jews into supporting um, rapid Israeli withdrawals because otherwise we're gonna, you know, run down the gauntlet into, you know, total demonization and isolation. And that's not really the case. Okay, thank you. Ron, please unmute yourself. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, hi. Uh, good evening, David. This is Ron speaking. Um, some two and a half um, decades ago, Yossi Balin surreptitiously and secretly um, uh, started a process that began, uh, that, uh, became the, um, the Oslo Accords. And given this period of calm with this new government, um, do you see that this possibly could happen with um, the anti-Zionist and post-Zionist members of this cabinet on the extreme left? And what safeguards can uh, be done, given what happened before, to prevent this kind of thing from happening again? Uh, thank you for your question, Ron. You, you, you're, you're right on the mark because uh, one of the um, uh, intended cabinet ministers in the new government, the Sawi Fredge, an Arab member of Knesset from Meretz, um, has said that the first thing he's going to do on his first day in office is drive to Ramallah and sit down with Mahmoud Abbas and try to start uh, a new peace process. Naftali Bennett, as prime minister, is going to have to get uh, control over his cabinet quickly. He can't allow um, members of his cabinet to go rogue and everybody... Um, going off on their pet projects and certainly not on something as sensitive as relations with Mahmoud Abbas's Palestinian so-called authority. Um, and um, it will be a challenge uh, for, for the government. One has to remember that um, this government will only work if everybody really sticks to their job. Minister of Transportation sticks to transportation and uh, Minister of Health sticks to health and uh, the foreign defense and prime minister um, focus on foreign affairs and defense policy. And under the coalition accords, they each have a veto over major policy initiatives and certainly matters such as relations to Palestinian Authority uh, cannot be farmed out to, uh, you know, every fringe member of the cabinet. So, uh, yeah, it will be uh, an urgent task. Interesting uh, for, time. Yeah, for Bennett, Gantz, and uh, Lapid to keep control over their cabinet members. Okay, Jeff, your turn. Please unmute yourself. Shalom. Uh, David, tell me, are you aware that Israel is helping Biden with his dementia to make sure he doesn't get much worse over the next 40 odd months? Because if he doesn't get any worse and retains the status quo, one, we won't get Harris as, as president, and we will certainly find that the Democrats will be unelectable. What do you say to this? Um, I don't really know what to answer you, uh, Mr. <laughs> Steidner. Uh, um, I assume that um, Biden has good doctors and um, cares about his, uh, his mental functions and, um, and that uh, America, 
whether democratic America or Republican America uh, will um, provide Americans with uh, good choices for president, whether it's four years from now um, or eight years uh, from now. A, a bigger question than the question you've asked, I think is whether uh, Trump is going to try to run again and he will crowd out you know, almost everyone else in the Republican field. Um, and one has to wonder whether that's the best thing for the future of the Republican Party or for Israel, for that matter. Mm. Okay, Gary, and then Manny and Moish. Um, I noticed a couple of comments related to my question as well. The Arab party in the new government, um, their demands, some of them are quite reasonable in, in improving the civic conditions of Arabs in Israel. Um, do you think this might set a new style for the future where Arab parties won't concentrate on Palestinian, West Bank, etc. conditions, but uh, might build a new relationship between Arabs and, his, and Jews in Israel? <laughs> I right, thank you for that question, Mr. Luke, because it allows me to make two points that um, wouldn't have come up in this conversation had you not asked the question. Um, and they're as follows. Number one, unfortunately, no one has given the Netanyahu governments of the last decade credit uh, for the incredible amount of investment that the Netanyahu governments have invested in the Israeli Arab sector. No Israeli government until Netanyahu um, ever invested uh, tens of billions of shekels in Eastern Jerusalem um, or uh, in the Ar Israeli Arab community. And the reasons for that were clear. Uh, labor governments of the past had no interest in investing in Eastern Jerusalem because they planned to hand it back or hand it away or divide the city in the future under the terms of some peace accord. It's only the Netanyahu governments of the last 10 years that made the clear determination that Jerusalem would not be divided that have begun to invest in uh, municipal services, infrastructure, education, sports, culture, and arts, and so on in Eastern Jerusalem. Obviously, there's a long way to go, but the first thing that needs to be said is the Netanyahu governments of the last decade have done that. And the same is true for Israeli Arabs. Come to Israel and uh, spend a day at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. 40% uh, of the uh, student population is, is East Jerusalemite Arab, or Arabs from other parts of Israel. Walk into any pharmacy in this country. And 80% of all pharmacists in this country are Israeli Arabs and go into any, any Israeli uh, emergency hospital room. Uh, it's 50% Arabs and 50% Russian Jews and no one else. Uh, so there have been incredible advances um, in uh, the Israeli Arab community into greater integration in Israeli society and the Tanao government should get credit for that. Now, Mansour Abbas's entry into the next government um, with his Ra'am faction um, is interesting for the following reason. Of the four Israeli Arab parties, his is the most Islamist. They're the most from. You know, they're the Haredim of uh, the Arab, Israeli Arab um, community. And like the Haredim who say that we think that Israel was a theological mistake uh, and we don't really recognize the Zionist movement as because it's not religious as a, as a movement from God. Nevertheless, we want to partner and be in the government because we have things that our community needs. We need money for our yeshivas and kolim and so on and our institutions and our schools. And Rams is saying the same thing. Um, we're not Zionist. And uh, theologically, the establishment of Israel is uh, an affront to uh, their radical Islamic ideology. And nevertheless, they want to partner. Now, Israel has seen this pattern of behavior before. In all the work that the Netanyahu government has done over the uh, last decade in Eastern Jerusalem, its closest partners in the, Israel, in the Eastern Jerusalemite Arab community um, are Hamas leaders. Not the Fatah leaders, not the PLO. Um, the PLO has this policy of non-cooperation with Israel, not to normalize Israeli relations with Israel, not to recognize, not to cooperate. The Mukhtars in Eastern Jerusalem, who are associated with Hamas, on the other hand, 
um, while hating the Zionist regime, are more than willing to cooperate with municipal officials in Jerusalem in getting their roads paved, their schools improved, um, getting municipal tax monies uh, for uh, after school programs and so on. They take a practical approach um, to uh, dealings with the Israeli government. I learned this primarily from a gentleman named uh, Dr. David Koren, who is a fellow at uh, the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Koren was Nir Barkat's advisor on Eastern Jerusalem Arab affairs for the last decade. Today, he's in charge of the educational system in Eastern Jerusalem for the Israeli Minister of Education. He's a true expert. He knows every single sheikh, every single mukhtar, every single community center leader in Eastern Jerusalem. And that pattern is already established. Now, that could be what will develop with uh, Mansour Abbas and his Ram party. Most of his demands in the coalition negotiations have related to um, things that the Israeli Arab community needs. There are some more controversial parts of the uh, <laughs> agreement with, the, with, with this Arab party that relate to um, illegal Arab construction in the Galil, uh, in the Galilee and the Negev. Um, how that plays out remains to be seen. Okay, thanks, David. Manny, please unmute yourself. Right. <clears throat> Hi. Um, just to make two comments. One, uh, at a meeting in the Mizrahi many years ago, and in other subsequent things, the issue was raised that there was no Palestine or Palestinians prior to '64. And the Israelis and the Knesset and the publicity agents have all started using the issue or the name, instead of calling them Palestinian or Israeli Muslims, calling them Palestinians, and therefore creating the or maintaining or supporting the myth that there was a Palestine and an indigenous population pre-mandate. Why is that continuing? I don't know, since it seems to underscore the strengthening of the Arab side. And that doesn't make sense to me at all. If we're saying that the Palestinians were only a uh, population that came in over the last 100, 200, 300 years in the great numbers, we're supporting their view by calling them Palestinians and not Muslims. That's number yes. one. Number two, can I just raise this issue? Yesterday in a um, Zoom with Ajak, uh, Ehud Yari said that Israel has neglected its publicity or its information or its Hasbara to the Western world. Giving an example is that there was a huge amount of information about the destruction of that tower, which had which held Hamas and the reporters. The Israelis had that information, didn't disseminate it. I don't understand why Israel is so poor in its explanation uh, of its case to the Western world. Okay, thanks, Manny. Well, yes, uh, what do you think, David? Let me respond quickly to uh, your two questions and then tell you a story, which I think uh, will, a personal uh, story that will demonstrate the difficulty of Hasbara, no matter what Israel does or AJA does. Uh, your questions about Hasbara go back to Mr. Michael Bird's um, you know, questions earlier. It may be unfair that the world believes there's a Palestinian people and that they have a right to an independent state. Um, and that historically there, there never was a Palestinian people, but that's irrelevant because that's the situation today. There's no way of turning back the clock and convincing the global community that the Palestinians are not an independent people, at least not in my view. It's the same with attempts to point to historical precedents such as San Remo um, and the League of Nations and other historical documents um, that, that anchor Israel's rights and in a way that you know, pushes down Palestinian rights. These appeal to historical precedents don't get very far. People's eyes glaze over when you start quoting historical documents and they tune out. It just doesn't work, certainly not in a world today where the, uh, the progressive racialist discourse has become stronger. Now, let me tell you this story. Um, 20 years ago, I was the uh, spokesman of uh, the Sheba Medical Center, Tel Shomer Hospital, largest hospital in the Middle East, one of the hospitals, biggest hospitals in the world. 
and all the way, uh, you know, all the way back then, we already had missiles falling on Steyrot fired uh, from Gaza. And there came a moment in time when we had two patients sharing one room. One was um, uh, and a young Israeli boy who had lost a leg in a um, Hamas rocket attack uh, on the uh, basketball court where he was playing with his brother. And the second patient was a young Palestinian kid um, who uh, had lost a leg or some other serious injury um, in an Israeli missile strike in Gaza. The hospital was treating them both, and they were both in the same room, and that's rare. I sought to get um, foreign correspondents to come to the hospital and do a story. Great story, right? I mean, uh, both sides of the conflict. It was close to impossible to get any foreign correspondent or for any foreign editor to, to, to do the story. Why? Because it makes Israel look good. It makes Israel look good. Israel's uh, treating the Palestinians as well as own. It, 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 it curries sympathy for the Israelis as well as perhaps for the Palestinians. I'll tell you that in the end, I did succeed. I had one uh, Spanish foreign correspondent who did a great television segment on this. And believe it or not, the New York Times ran a front page story below the fold, but nevertheless, a front page story with color photos about these two kids, one Israeli, one Palestinian, being treated at Shiva Medical Center. Of course, the New York Times editor was convinced to do this because of the balance. It was very carefully balanced, you know. We lose and they lose, you know. Uh, we're causing casualties and they're causing casualties. That was the only way to get the story in. Uh, it's very difficult. Try to get a story in the New York Times or the Toronto Star Never mind the London Times about um, Israel's earthquake aid to um, to Romania or its um, high tech and food tech work with the Emirates. Very difficult. Mm. Okay, Moish, um, we'll just take your yours as the last question, and uh, we're coming up to time, so we'll ask you to be brief. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my question or comment follows on the, the last few statements in relation to selling our story. Uh, it, be, it would be very welcome if you could actually suggest, to can, can continue suggesting what practical things can we do given the very uphill battle that we're facing. And it seems that, that in a sense, there's an inequality between our side and their side in that all, all the Arabs, they call them Palestinians, whatever you want to call them, they all accept the narrative of, the, of that side, that they've got close links and got historical links and so on and so forth and rights to that territory. Where in our case, we've got Israelis who are happy to say, no, we, we, well, we may have these rights, but we, we, we are prepared to negotiate and talk and we're prepared to see territory. And similarly, in terms of the American Jewry, Again, we've got a very strong body of American Jews who don't buy into our, our, our narrative that we see that our historical rights and the good things that we do for the world. Yeah, what do you think, David? Um, are, we, are we pushing uphill with, with the way we're, we're presenting Israel's case? Hey, let me say this. Um, as you mentioned in your int kind introduction uh, to me, uh, Alan, um, I grew up in Toronto and I've continued to, and I worked for many years before moving uh, to Israel for the Canadian pro-Israel lobby, um, then known as CIC, now known as CJA, and Canadian public opinion, and I continue to work for them today as well somewhat, Canadian public opinion is somewhat similar to Australian public opinion as I know it, in that most people, when you ask them, um, don't necessarily want their government to be solidly pro-Israel or solidly pro-Arab, pro-Palestinian. They want their government to see conflict resolution. Um, they want their government to be supportive of peace. Um, and they don't want to hear the mutual recriminations of both sides. He started it. He hit first. He shot at me first. I've suffered more. They've suffered more. What they want to know is that you're committed to living at peace with your neighbors. And therefore, as much as it's uncomfortable for some of us 
to do that because we naturally want to express our outrage at the unfair treatment of Israel, both in global diplomacy and uh, in global public diplomacy. The first thing you have to do um, is reiterate Israel's desire to live at peace with its neighbors, unlike the jihadists who want to conquer Arabic and Islamic nations from uh, Indonesia to Tunisia and perhaps part of Europe as well. Now, if the Emiratis and Bahrainis can understand that, if they can understand that Israel has a hand outreach for peace and that Israel is a force for good in the region, then Western liberals should be able to stand to that as well. But it has to start by emphasizing always that Israel seeks conflict resolution, not jihad. We don't want to have to go to war with Hamas again um, or to arrest uh, a thousand Palestinians every month in nighttime raids um, in the West Bank. It's not enough to restate Israel's security dilemmas. Um, it's not enough. Uh, we have to always restate Israel's willingness to be generous towards the Palestinians. And as I said earlier in this conversation, also to restate the basic justice of Israel's cause and its grand purpose um, as a Zionist homeland. Um, if you don't start with that, you don't get in the door uh, in today's world. Mm, fascinating. David, look, with. have uh... We're, we're, we've come up to time. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, you've really opened up um, some some new trains of thought for us, I think, in the way you're 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 analysing the situation. And uh, we'll see what people think. I'm sure we would love to have you back and explore this a little more because there's probably a lot more that we could talk about. But but thank you for joining us. It's been fascinating. And uh, it's just been wonderful to have you. And we, we love what the JISS does. And, uh, and thank you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alan, and thank all of you. I'm honored by uh, the great number of people who joined this conversation. Yep. So, OK, so just before we leave, I'll hand back to David. And uh, he'll uh, wrap it up, and then we'll say good night. OK, well, uh, thank you also from me. Uh, David, for the very interesting discussion. And uh, there are so many different uh, dimensions and aspects to it. Uh, I have a couple in reserve about the administration of American foreign aid, about some of the uh, American leftist organisations like NIF and J Street and their impact on the scene, but we'll have to leave those sort of subjects for another day. So that just foreshadows to you some of the things we might discuss in the future. Um, the remaining task I have is to uh, let people know what we're doing next week. And we have uh, something that's a little different uh, next week. We have a Canadian guest, uh, David Matlow, who happens to be an expert on Theodore Herzl and owns the world's largest collection of Herzl memorabilia. So uh, we'll be having one of those uh, fascinating uh, historical discussions and insights uh, into the development of the state of Israel from a Herzl perspective. And finally, as we always do, uh, we want everyone here to support AJA. If you are not yet uh, on our email list, uh, go to the website jewishassociation.org.au uh, and sign up. Like and follow the Facebook page and we need tangible support as well. So if you're not yet a member, uh, please sign up via the website or make a donation. Um, all these things are uh, very important to keep the organization going so that we can represent the community and do uh, principled Israel advocacy. So back to you, Alan, for the sign off, thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you, uh, everybody. Um, thanks again to David M. And thanks to, uh, to you, David, and to Michael. Uh, until next week, where we look forward to joining you, we'll wish you a very good night and say goodbye to you all. Thanks again. Bye now.